in English when we talk about someone being single-minded. The implication is that the person is very focused on a one single purpose or one single aim. It's a quality of the, the will. And that's a very relevant way of thinking about concentration. It's not that you should have a single object that you're focused on at the moment, but your purpose is single as well. You're going to stay right here and not let anything else distract you. So concentration is a quality both of awareness and of the will. And to strengthen it, you have to think about the qualities that strengthen your will. It turns out they're the same as the qualities that strengthen your mindfulness. On the one hand, you Observe the precepts as practice in making promises to yourself that you then try to keep. You promise to yourself that you're not going to kill anything, not even little insects, not even termites. No stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking of intoxicants. You set that up as a promise, and then you try to keep to it. And you learn things about yourself in the process. One is you learn the areas where you have difficulties, and two, you've got to learn how to negotiate with your conflicting intentions. This is where the second quality comes in, is having right view. Realizing why this is important, why you want to be doing this. All too often we think of developing our willpower simply as a kind of a brute force. And the force of willpower can last only for so long on its own. It needs help. And the main way you can help it is through adjusting your understanding. For instance, with the precepts, when you begin to see that life actually does get better, things get a lot easier when you're holding to the precepts. Once you have that perception that you're making things easier for yourself, it changes the equation. The precepts are not such a battle. And so what you've done is you've changed your understanding, you've changed your perception. And the same thing applies with concentration. The Buddha talks about times when you try to focus on the breath and the mind is not willing to settle down. He says there's either fever in the body or there's a fever in the mind, an unwillingness to stay settled. He doesn't say just kind of bulldoze through. He says switch over to something you find inspiring. This is why an important adjunct to Focusing on the breath, focusing on the body, are the various recollections, because they help get your view straightened out and help strengthen your motivation for why you're here. And John Lee talks about how important it is to develop a sense of sangwega if you're going to get the mind to really settle down. You can contemplate the parts of the body, and it's not necessarily about an issue of lust. Simply your attachment to this physical hunk here, this physical lump. And then you look into it, what is there there? All kinds of things you wouldn't want to associate with. That if your stomach was sitting on a chair next to you at the dinner table, you wouldn't want to have a conversation. You'd be grossed out. And your lungs and all the other parts. They're not the kind of things you'd want to socialize with. And yet so much of our life, so much of our energy is devoted to keeping the body healthy, keeping it comfortable. And 
And that's just the reasonable things we do with the body. Then there are other things. We get totally obsessed with its looks. We got totally obsessed with how we're going to have to keep it as young as possible. Whatever. And when you can learn how to see the futility of the whole thing. You develop a sense of sangwagen, a sense of dismay. And it's very chastening. And sometimes that sense of being chastened is what brings the mind into the present moment. You look at the various activities in your life and they begin to seem very futile. And you begin to see the importance of getting the mind trained so it doesn't have to depend on the body, doesn't have to depend on things outside for its happiness. And you begin to see that the discovery of the Dharma, the discovery of something really is deathless inside, is something really worthwhile. And it's your only hope for any kind of genuine happiness. And when you learn how to motivate yourself in this way, or in whatever way works, it's something that's really very individual. Sometimes you read the different Ajahns talking about the kind of contemplation that really brought their minds down to concentration. And it just seems to roll off your back. It's not that grabbing. That's not that compelling. Well, you have to look into your own mind to see, well, well it is compelling. How do you motivate yourself? Sometimes it's a contemplation of death. Sometimes you think of something more inspiring, like the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. And there's a whole host of other ways of developing strategies and motivating yourself. I've been reading about how different writers motivate themselves. There's one, Anthony Trollope, who made a vow to himself that he would write X number of words every day. And he wouldn't leave his writing room until he'd finished that. And that meant, of course, that sometimes he was writing garbage, but at least he was churning out a certain amount. And he got so after a while, it wasn't garbage. Raymond Chandler had a different approach. He'd give himself four hours every day to write. And if he wasn't writing, he wouldn't do anything else. He'd just sit there doing nothing. And pretty soon the boredom would bring up something. Because he had found that if he allowed himself to read or do this or do that during the four hours, then the nothing would come. But if the choice was simply, Okay, nothing or writing. He was pretty soon writing. So different people have different techniques, different approaches. And a large part of learning how to understand yourself and how to deal with your defilements lies in figuring out what approach works for you, what strategies get you more motivated to practice. As the Buddha said, one of the measures of your wisdom and discernment is how you talk yourself out of doing things that you like to do but you know give bad results, and how you talk yourself into doing things you don't like to do but you know give good results. That's one of the main measures of your wisdom. We tend to think of wisdom as the kind of thing that comes at the very end of the practice, those short, pointed statements that come in books about wisdom. But to really develop it, you have to develop a pragmatic approach to how you're going to get things to work in the mind and how you're going to get yourself motivated. This is why so many of the Thai Ajans were people of few words, but the words were really sharp and pointed, because they had honed things down to what works, what ways of thinking work, what ways of motivating themselves work. Get right to the jugular right fast. 
then you get down to work. So that's an important part of wisdom and discernment, and it's something we all have to develop. Learn how to psych ourselves out to see what way of thinking, what application of right view is going to really hit the mind so that it's motivated to practice. This is an extremely important part of the practice, and we can learn about the steps and all the different techniques in dealing with the breath, getting the mind to settle down with the breath, making the breath comfortable. I mean, that's one of the important strategies right there. How you conceive of the breath, thinking of the breath as energy throughout the body. That's one set of skills and strategies so that you learn how to associate sitting in meditation with a sense of well-being, a sense of refreshment. And you have that to tap into when the mind gets antsy and wants a quick fix of pleasure. But there are lots of other issues that are going on in the mind as well in terms of your motivation, why you're here, why you're doing this. And it's good to think about it, to be clear about it. Wisdom doesn't come from simply turning off the thinking in the mind and just trying to observe, observe, observe without any input at all. That teaches you some lessons, but there are a lot of lessons that never get learned that way. Insight practice is also a, a matter of exploration, experimentation, trying to figure things out. Why is it that greed, aversion, and delusion can still have power over the mind when you've learned so much about their drawbacks? What's still their gratification? What can you do in order to wean yourself off that? Teach yourself new ways of feeding. This is up to your own ingenuity. But that's how you strengthen your concentration. You come to stillness of mind by learning how to think about how important stillness of mind is and how much you want it. Without that sense of motivation, the single-mindedness of your concentration doesn't stay single for long. So if you find that your concentration is weak, look at two other things in addition to the actual topic you're focused on. You can adjust the breath, work with the breath. If that's not working, you have to look at your precepts, okay, what's wrong with the precepts? And then you look at your motivation. Why are we doing this? How do you deal with the different committee members in the mind that are pulling you away? And as you experiment with these different approaches, you'll find the ones that will work. So your single-mindedness really is single. It really does develop power, because without the strength of the concentration, your discernment will be strong enough to deal with the defilements. So the two of them have to work together. Your discernment strengthens your concentration, your concentration strengthens your discernment. Basika Gee's images of a person washing hands. Your left hand has to wash your right, and your right hand washes your left, and that's how they both get clean. 